Stephen Hawking was considered one of the most brilliant theoretical physicists in history. From the Big Bang to black holes, his work on the macrocosm's origins and structure revolutionized the field. Hawking was born in Oxford into a family of croakers. He began his university education at University College, Oxford, in 1959. He entered a first-class BA degree in drugs. Peddling began his graduate work at Trinity Hall, Cambridge, in 1962. He attained his Ph.D. degree in applied mathematics and theoretical drugs, specializing in general reciprocity and cosmology, in March 1966. Like Isaac Newton, he was the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at the University of Cambridge between 1979 and 2009. At age 21, while studying cosmology at the University of Cambridge, he was diagnosed with a myotrophic site sclerosis, ALS. Part of his life story was depicted in the 2014 film The Proposition of Everything. Preface the Proposition of Everything is a series of lectures given by Stephen Hawking. The thing of these lectures is to outline what scientists believe is the history of the macrocosm. As a result, he offers a history of wisdom's understanding of the macrocosm. Also, he easily explains the events that unfolded incontinently after the Big Bang. Hawking also covers the cosmological field he's most notorious for the study of black holes. Story Shot Number 1 The Original for Ideas About the Universe Aristotle Aristotle considered the idea of a round earth as beforehand as 340 BC. In his book, On the Welkin, he wrote about two propositions that suggested earth was globular. First out, he'd observed that the Earth being between the Sun and the Moon caused the Moon eclipses. As the Earth's shadow on the Moon was always round, this suggested the Earth was round. Aristotle learned from his peregrination that the pole star is lower in the sky when viewed in the south. Again, this would propose that the Earth is globular rather than slice-shaped. Although Aristotle's conclusions were correct, his propositions were still defective. For illustration, he believed the Earth was stationary and that the Sun, Moon, globes, and stars had indirect routeways around the Earth. Ptolemy Ptolemy erected upon these ideas in the first century announcement. He created a complete cosmological model with Earth at the center. Eight spheres carrying the Moon, Sun, stars, and five globes girdled the Earth. The five known globes were Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Again, Ptolemy made apparent miscalculations in his proposition. Still, he developed Aristotle's ideas and handed a nicely accurate system for prognosticating the positions of the structures visible at night. The Christian Church generally accepted this proposition, incompletely because it placed the Earth at the center of the macrocosm. Copernicus. In 1514, Nicholas Copernicus suggested an important simpler model of the macrocosm. Copernicus was a Polish clerk. He also published his model anonymously for fear of being indicted of heterodoxy. Copernicus argued that the Sun was stationary at the center of the macrocosm. The Earth and globes moved in indirect routeways around the Sun. No bone took this idea seriously until roughly 100 times laterally. At this point, Johannes Kepler and Galileo Galilei started intimately supporting this proposition. The lately constructed telescope supported Copernicus' view that the Earth wasn't the center of the macrocosm. Galileo observed that several moons root Jupiter. This inferred there was no need for all Elysian bodies to root the Earth. Some still denied that the Earth was in the center of the macrocosm, however. They stated that Jupiter's moons moved on extremely complicated paths around the Earth, suggesting that they circumvent Jupiter. Newton In 1687, Newton published his Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. 
Pedling describes this as arguably the most pivotal work ever published in the physical lores. In this book, Newton proposed a proposition of how bodies moved in space and time. This proposition also explained a new idea of universal solemnity. Newton suggested that every Elysian body in the macrocosm was attracted to every other body. The larger the body, the stronger the gravitational pull. Newton went on to show that greatness causes the moon to move in an elliptical route around the Earth. Likewise, greatness also causes the Earth and the globes to follow elliptical paths around the Sun. There was still no hint of an expanding or contracting macrocosm despite these advances before the 20th century. It was generally accepted that either the macrocosm was ever in a stable state or was created at a finite time in the history. Still, several academics questioned the possibility of an horizonless, stationary macrocosm. For illustration, Heinrich Olbers argued that nearly every line or side would end on the face of a star in an horizonless, stationary macrocosm. As a result, one would anticipate the whole sky to be as bright as the sun, indeed at night. The only way to avoid this conclusion would be if the stars weren't shining ever. For illustration, they could have turned on at some finite time in the history. Story shot number two, the expanding universe. Multiple worlds. Our sun and the near stars are all part of the Milky Way. For a long time, there was an agreement that the Milky Way was the entire macrocosm. Still, in 1925, Edwin Hubble demonstrated that the Milky Way wasn't the only world. He set up numerous other worlds with vast quantities of space between them. To prove the legality of his proposition, he'd to identify how expansive these empty spaces were. One way to directly identify a star's distance from Earth is grounded on brilliance. The brilliance of a star is grounded on the star's refulgence and its distance down. Thus, if we can identify a star's refulgence, we can use the apparent brilliance to calculate the distances down. Hubble argued certain stars always had the same refulgence when they were near enough for us to measure however, we could assume they had the same refulgence if we set up similar stars in another world. Therefore, we could calculate the distance to that world. We could be nicely sure that our estimate is accurate if numerous stars in the same world gave the same distance. Hubble calculated the distances to nine worlds this way. We now know that our world is only one of a hundred thousand million that ultramodern telescopes can observe. There are some hundred thousand million stars within each world. Expanding Universe Hubble linked that the worlds he observed all appeared redshifted. Redshift is a crucial conception for astronomers. We can understand it literally the wavelength of the light is stretched, so the light is seen as shifted towards the red part of the diapason. This means each of these worlds is moving down from us. Also, the speed at which each world moved down from us depended on its distance. The further down a world was, the briskly it moved down from us. Pedling describes this finding as one of the tremendous intellectual exposures of the 20th century. Structure on General Relativity and the Friedman Equations Alexander Friedman, a Soviet physicist and mathematician, developed models of general reciprocity to regard for the expanding macrocosm thesis. Friedman showed that the macrocosm is expanding so sluggishly that the gravitational magnet between the different worlds is decelerating the macrocosm's expansion. As a result, the expansion might be stopping. Also, the worlds will start moving towards each other as the macrocosm contracts. Friedman also suggested the macrocosm could be expanding so fleetly that the gravitational magnet would end stop this expansion. It might decelerate down a bit, but the worlds will ultimately reach a state where they're moving piecemeal at a steady speed. Eventually, Friedman offered a result whereby the macrocosm is expanding just presto enough to avoid compression. With this result, the speed at which the worlds move piecemeal will get lower. 
It'll no way reach zero but will reach a stage where the movement is nearly zero. We presently know about the world's expansion because the macrocosm is expanding between 5% and 10% every thousand million times. Still, we're doubtful which of Friedman's results are correct, as we're doubtful of the world's mass. It's challenging to identify the mass of worlds, as dark matter is present across worlds. Dark matter is composed of patches that don't absorb, reflect, or emit light, so they cannot be detected by observing electromagnetic radiation. We cannot see dark matter directly. We know that dark matter exists because of its effect on objects we can observe directly. Likewise, we cannot fluently identify the mass of dark matter. The Big Bang The Friedman results state that the distance between bordering worlds must have been zero between 10 and 20,000 million times agone. At that time, which we call the Big Bang, the macrocosm's viscosity and spacetime curve would have been horizonless. This means the general proposition of reciprocity predicts a singular point in the macrocosm. The issue with a singular point in the macrocosm is that this supports a biblical perspective. Thus, the Church espoused the Big Bang as being a godly intervention. Therefore, there were several attempts to avoid the Big Bang conclusion. The volition was a steady state proposition. The steady state proposition was suggested in 1948 and argued that worlds moved down from each other. Still, new worlds were continually forming in the gaps in between. These new worlds are formed from new matter that's being constantly created. Hence, the macrocosm looks roughly the same at all times and at all points in space. Story shot number three the concept of black holes. The term black hole is a fairly recent one. It was chased in 1969 by John Wheeler, but it's at least 200 times old as a conception. Two centuries agone, there were two propositions of light. One argued that light is composed of patches. The other proposition argued that light is composed of swells. In reality, both of these propositions are correct. Those who believed in flyspeck proposition argued that this could impact our understanding of stars. They allowed that stars were both massive and compact enough for their greatness to drag back any light emitted from the star's face. The star might not emit light far enough for us to observe it, but we'd still feel its gravitational pull. Moment, we know these stars as black holes. The Life Cycle of a Star to understand black hole conformation, we must understand the life cycle of a star. Stars form when large quantities of hydrogen collapse in on themselves due to greatness. The compression leads to the gas colliding more constantly. As the gas moves at advanced pets, it heats up. When stars reach a critical temperature, the hydrogen tittles stop bouncing against each other. Rather, they combine, forming helium tittles. The heat of a star is what makes it shine, and it'll continue to burn until it runs out of energy, i.e., hydrogen. The further energy a star starts with, the sooner it runs out. This is due to the size of the star, taking further heat to balance its gravitational magnet. Advanced heats need further hydrogen. Our sun has presumably got enough power for another 5,000 million times or so. The Chandra Sekar Limit Subramanian Chandra Sekar, an Indian-American astrophysicist, used the proposition of reciprocity to show how the speed differences of star patches are limited. The patches cannot move briskly than the speed of light. A stable white dwarf star has an outside mass. When it reaches this mass, the magnet of graveness is so strong that it causes it to collapse in on itself. The Chandra Sekar limit is about 1.4 times the mass of our Sun. Another implicit state of stars is the neutron star state. These stars are much lower than a white dwarf. They're supported by the rejection aversion between neutrons and protons, in discrepancy to the usual relationship between electrons. 
These neutron stars only have a compass of roughly 10 long hauls. Eventually, any stars that fall above the limit may explode when their energy runs out. Numerous scientists, including Einstein, wrote papers explaining how this was insolvable. Despite these expostulations, Chandrasekhar entered the Nobel Prize in 1983 for his early work on the limiting mass of cold stars. Figure of Black Hole Conformation The star's gravitational field changes the paths of light shafts in spacetime. Light cones show the paths followed in space and time by flashes of light. They bend inwards near the star's face. As the star contracts, the gravitational field gets stronger at its face. The light cones bend further. This bending makes it more delicate for light from the star to escape. As a result, the light appears dimmer and redder to spectators. When enough loss has passed, the gravitational field at the face is so strong that light can no longer escape. Nothing can travel faster than light, so nothing differently can escape this gravitational field. This boundary of black holes forms the event horizon. It coincides with the paths of the light shafts that fail to escape from the black hole. Hawking's Discoveries The work that Roger Penrose and I did between 1965 and 1970 showed that, according to general reciprocity, there must be a oddity of horizonless viscosity within the black hole. This is rather like the Big Bang at the morning of time, only it would be an end of time for the collapsing body and the astronaut. At the oddity, the laws of wisdom and our capability to prognosticate the future would break down. Still, any bystander who remained outside the black hole would not be affected by this failure of pungency, because neither light nor any other signal can reach them from the oddity. Stephen Hawking, The Proposition of Everything This quotation suggests there are results to general reciprocity. An astronaut may see a oddity, allowing them to avoid hitting it. They could fall through the wormhole, transporting them to another region in the macrocosm in the form of space and time trip. Yet, Pedling admits that these results to the general reciprocity equation are unstable. The presence of an astronaut may beget a disturbance that would change the outgrowth. Also, they may not see the oddity until they hit it, and also they would die. The oddity always lies in their future and no way in their history. Black holes are exemplifications of scientific propositions developed as fine models before any experimental substantiation. Other notable terms Quasar A quasar is an extremely luminous active galactic nexus, AGN. A supermassive black hole with mass ranging from millions to billions of times the mass of the Sun. A gassy accretion fragment surrounds it. Pulsars A pulsar is a rotating neutron star. It emits beats of radio swells because of the indirection between its glamorous fields and girding matter. Story shot number 4 The Origin and Fate of the Universe In the 1980s, the Vatican invited peddling to a conference on cosmology. The Catholic Church had learned from its silencing of Galileo that they shouldn't help scientific discovery. Hence, they decided a better approach would be to invite numerous experts to advise them on cosmology. The Pope told Stephen Hawking that he shouldn't study the Big Bang despite this. The Pope viewed the Big Bang as the moment of creation. Peddling would not hear to this request. The Hot Big Bang Model This model assumes that Friedman's model describes the macrocosm. The macrocosm is expanding, reducing the temperature of matter and radiation. Temperature is a measure of the average energy of the patches. Hence, at high temperatures, the patches move so presto they aren't attracted to each other. Yet, as they cool, the patches start cementing. The Big Bang was when the macrocosm had no size, meaning it must have been infinitely hot. As the macrocosm expanded, the temperature of the radiation would have dropped. Despite this, the Big Bang would have passed at about 10,000 million degrees. This is the temperature of H. Lemon explosions. 
The world comported of photons, electrons, neutrinos, and some protons and neutrons. The macrocosm continued to expand, and the temperature dropped. The product rate of electron dyads would have fallen below the rate at which obliteration was destroying them. After 100 seconds, the temperature would have fallen to 1,000 million degrees. This is the temperature of the hottest stars. At this temperature, protons and neutrons would not have the energy to escape the strong magnet of nuclear forces. These protons and neutrons combined. They produced the capitals of heavy hydrogen and helium tittles and small quantities of rudiments like lithium and beryllium. Within a many hours of the Big Bang, the product of helium and other rudiments would have stopped. For the coming million times or so, the macrocosm continued expanding. Ultimately, the temperature dropped to a many thousand degrees. The electrons and capitals were no longer suitable to overcome their electromagnetic magnet. They would have started combining to form tittles. The macrocosm continued expanding and cooling. Slightly thick areas were braked by redundant gravitational magnet. This magnet stopped the expansion and led to a recollapse. The gravitational pull of matter outside these regions caused the tittles to rotate as they collapsed. As the collapsing areas came indeed lower, they started spinning briskly. Ultimately, they gauge presto enough to balance the magnet of greatness. This is a possible explanation of the launch of the fragments such like rotating worlds we see moment. Story shot number 5 What's the proposition of everything? Still, it should in time be accessible in broad principle by everyone, not just to many scientists, if we do discover a complete proposition. Also we shall each be suitable to take part in the discussion of why the macrocosm exists, however, it would be the ultimate triumph of mortal reason if we find the answer to that. For also we'd know the mind of God. Stephen Hawking the proposition of everything. Drugs has been suitable to describe the onsets of our macrocosm with some partial propositions. These propositions describe a limited range of compliances. They neglect other goods that aren't yet understood. The thing of cosmology and drugs is to find a complete, harmonious, unified proposition of the world. Stephen Hawking describes this as the junction of drugs. Einstein spent utmost of his after time searching for this unified proposition. We're now in a much stronger position than Einstein to develop a unified view. Stephen Hawking is cautiously auspicious that we will discover the ultimate laws of nature. He's confident that we will find a complete unified proposition one day if we're smart enough. This unified proposition isn't an ultimate proposition. Rather, we've an horizonless sequence of propositions that each describe the macrocosm with further delicacy. Our current views on amount drugs have set us up to uncover the full secrets of the macrocosm. Stephen Hawking's book is a great starting point for understanding how the macrocosm works and the significance of stars within it.